You see it every day during KSAT's weather segment. We watch it on our phones, of course. In fact, our meteorologists would say that it's the most, most important tool they have. Yeah, but how does Doppler radar really work? How can it see a storm? How does it see bats? Where are these radars? All questions that we hope to answer in today's KSAT Explains. And naturally, we recruited one of our own meteorologists for this one. Here's Justin Horn. Bracken Cave is uh, the home to the largest colony of bats in the world. We're talking about 20 million Mexican free tail bats. For those who have never been to Bracken Bat Cave, the bat emergence is a sight to behold. Right there at the cave, we call it a bat NATO because it's literally a swirling vortex of bats there at the cave. And then you can see them streaming away, this river of bats in the sky. What these bats lack in size, they make up for in quantity which explains why we can see these fascinating creatures, not just with our eyes. If you've ever wondered where Bracken Bat Cave is located, you need to look no further than Doppler radar. During the evenings in the summer, you can often see them coming out of the cave. It looks like a circle on the radar. You can sometimes see them coming back into the cave in the mornings as well. We have a bat NATO at night and raining bats in the morning. All due to their feeding schedule. And this giant soccer ball looking structure sees every bit of it. The radar will rotate around and uh, send out pulses in all directions. Matt Brady is a meteorologist at the National Weather Service in New Braunfels, where this Doppler radar is located. Brady knows radars inside and out. So this is an interesting case because we had thunderstorms and then the bats came out after the thunderstorms. Those pulses Brady speaks of are radio waves sent out from the radar that bounce off objects in the atmosphere. Any objects, as is the case with bats and occasionally insects like butterflies. But most commonly, it's weather. Once the energy strikes an object, it scatters in all directions. Only a small portion of the energy is scattered back to the radar. But that's how we know it's there. The radar can also detect the movement of that object away or towards the radar. Measuring this works like sound waves and the Doppler effect. Hence the name Doppler radar, which is what all modern weather radars are. It then takes that data, converts it, and maps it. We look at it constantly every day. It can be argued it's the single most important tool for a meteorologist, but that wasn't always the case. Radar has come a long way. Radar really was developed for the, to assist in maritime navigation. In the early 1900s, ships needed radar to avoid collisions in the fog. Then, as World War II approached, it was the Army Signal Corps that developed radar as a means of defense. In fact, the U.S. Army Signal Corps coined the, the acronym RADAR, Radio Detection and Ranging. In 1934, they conducted the uh, experiments on behalf of the United States Navy because the Navy was concerned, again, back, uh, about nav maritime navigation. By wartime, these experimental radars could detect aircraft, too, as was the case on December 7, 1941. They spotted a flight of planes 136 nautical miles north of Oahu, of course, is the Japanese invasion fleet for Pearl Harbor. Many countries experimented with radar during this time, and it took off. Radar was a boon for air traffic controllers. It also was later developed for radio astronomy. Traffic cops now use it later on to check with speeders. But it was detecting weather where, arguably, it proved most useful. So after the war, some of the radars were donated to the Weather Bureau. Now there are 159 weather radars strategically placed throughout the U.S. and its territories, and they've been in use ever since. And they've improved. About 10 to 15 years ago, there was new technology that the Doppler radar has uh, adapted called dual polarization. This means we went from only looking horizontally through the atmosphere to looking horizontally and vertically. This change has been a huge step forward in the world of meteorology. It can uh, tell us how uh, strong a thunderstorm may be. Uh, it could also detect uh, possible rotation. And for Brady, this very technology helped in a severe weather outbreak this past March. While we were in the KSAD Storm Chaser, he was radar operator at the National Weather Service that day. It was a significant tornado, it was an EF2. Brady and the National Weather Service, who are responsible for issuing warnings, tagged their tornado warning with the wording, tornado on the ground without any eyewitness confirmation because they could see debris on the radar kicked up by the tornado itself. This helped get word out faster. For San Antonio, we utilized two radars, one near Brackettville and this one in New Braunfels. We wanted a closer look, so after a 90-foot climb up some pretty steep steps, we make it inside the radar, which protects the radar itself from the elements. It looks kind of like a soccer ball. Right now we're inside the radome, and if the radar were in use, it would be spinning around. It's on the other side of this dish where waves emit and return near the speed of light. During calm air, 
During calm weather, it's going much slower, but then during very violent weather, like tornadoes possibly, it's really spinning fast and it's, it's making cuts in the air very quickly, as fast as it physically can. It's a big piece of machinery, and if a human were to stand in the way of the emitting waves, which is not advised, you'd feel your body starting to heat up like a microwave. The radar tilts so it's never aimed towards the ground or us, but instead through varying parts of thunderstorms. And that could allow us to see higher up in the thunderstorms and see if a hail core is developing above the ground. In other words, we can see if a storm may produce large hail before that hail even makes it to the surface. We can even see the difference between sleet and snow. At the end of the day, it's all of these things that make radar invaluable. It helps you plan your day, it helps us forecast the weather, and if you ever want to know what the bats are up to, it helps with that too. For KSAT Explains, I'm Justin Horn. It's science. Fascinating. If you would like to see more KSAT Explains episodes like this one, take your phone out, scan the QR code on your screen right now. It'll take you directly to the KSAT Explains webpage. Expect a new episode every Monday right here on the News at 6.